Everyone, very excited about today's episode. Probably one of our most requested, and I would also say one of our most important episodes that we have done and that it's time to do again, but also do again in, in a better way. We are going to be speaking with JL Collins, author of The Simple Path to Wealth and The Stock Series, which you can find at jlcollinsnh.com. Probably one of the most influential books in this community has sold hundreds of thousands of copies. And what I think is really important to note about that is that that is with literally a $0 marketing budget. Every one of those copies has been sold entirely due to word of mouth because people have been looking for this information. They've been looking for a way to share this information with friends, with family members. And the reviews on this book are unlike anything I've ever seen. We all know that there's books out there that are just fake it till they make it stats that just have massive budgets behind them. And they, the only reason they're at the level that they're at is because, you know, money has just been thrown at them. This is the opposite of that. This book has had the impact that it's had and has the reach that it has because people want everybody to know about this information. And in the Phi community, I cannot think of a single book literally to date that has had more of an impact than The Simple Path to Wealth. And uh, we have the good fortune of having the author of that book, J.L. Collins, on the show with us today to really talk about the why behind this book. But even more important than that, the actual philosophy, the underpinnings of this investment strategy, which can be simply defined as let's keep it simple and you'll actually do better. So with that, welcome to the ultimate crowdsourced personal finance show. This is Choose FI. You're listening to Choose FI Radio. The blueprint for financial independence lives here. If you're looking to unlock the secrets to financial independence and early retirement, you're in the right place. Stay tuned and join a community of like-minded people who are getting off the hamster wheel and taking control of their lives in the pursuit of financial independence. Choose FI, your home for financial independence online. All right, very excited to dive into today's episode, and we're going to be speaking with the author of The Simple Path to Wealth and the Stock Series, J.L. Collins. And to help me with this, I have my co-host, Brad, here with me today. Brad, very exciting today. How you doing, buddy? Oh, man, I am doing quite well. It's hard to not be doing well when you're getting ready to talk to J.L. Collins. And like you said, The Stock Series, The Simple Path to Wealth, I mean, it's not hyperbole to say that that content changed my entire life. It changed the trajectory of my investing life. And it's put me in a place where I feel comfortable investing and you cannot overstate how important that is. Yeah. I mean, Jim has come to be a friend of ours, a friend of the show, a friend of mine personally. It's amazing. He's just a, an incredible human being. And, uh, with that, Jim, a real heartfelt thanks for coming back on the show. Welcome. It's an honor to, to be asked. I think we should end, end the interview now because there's nothing I can say that is going to top what that introduction was. So you thank you for the very kind words. I'm honored. It was well-deserved. And we're obviously going to dive into the stock series, but I think the, or into the simple path to wealth. But I think the way to start there is actually do an origin story and not so much an origin story for you as much, although there's going to be probably some overlap here, but really an origin story for this book, the simple path to wealth, because I think those two are uh, intertwined and specifically for the reason this book has done as well is because people want to share and what you encapsulate in this book is probably the easiest thing in the world to share with people that are trying to make sense of what has always seemed so complicated and out of reach. So let's just start there. Tell us a bit more about the origin of this book and you know what explains the success that you've seen with it, but also why you took the time to create it. So if you'll indulge me, I'm going to go back and actually start with the origin of the blog, because the book was an outgrowth of the blog at jlcollinsnh.com. So in 2011, my daughter was in college. I had managed to turn her off to all things financial by pushing the information too hard, too early, too fast. And I decided I really needed to put something down on paper for that I wanted her to know about how to invest and how to handle money for the day that she was ready to hear it. And just in case I wasn't around to personally deliver it. And a friend of mine said, you know, uh, you ought to archive this stuff on a blog. And it's pretty interesting, maybe share it with some friends and family. And I, I had no interest in starting a blog, but I love the idea of having a place to archive this as opposed to just pieces of paper or a document on my computer. 
And so I did that. And much to my amazement, the audience started to grow. Ironically, my family and friends didn't care about it, but there were strangers who found their way to it. And um, the next thing I knew, I had an international audience and and I'd had a body of work that had been put together. And I'd always kind of had an ambition to write a book, but I never had a, a subject in mind until that moment. And so it, let's see, it'd probably be about 20 13, I started work on the book, finished it in the early part of 16 and, and published it that uh, spring. And as I've said to people many times, there's by design, there is nothing in the book that you can't find on the blog. The book's a little more concise. It's better organized. I won't say the writing's more polished. I'll say I spent more time polishing it and let the reader decide if, if I succeeded or not. And it really, I have wrote it for my daughter. And you know, I hoped it would be successful, at least within the FI community. I never dreamed that it would have the success that it's had or that, what is it, four years later, it would be selling even better than every year it sold better than the year before, which just amazes me. That was far beyond my expectations. And somebody observed to me that there's a voice of authenticity in it that people respond to. And I suspect that's because it is authentic, because this is the information I wrote for my daughter. I frequently said there's only one person I've ever tried to persuade about this stuff, and that is uh, that is her. And by the way, if anybody's curious, at this point, as she's a young adult, she's on board and she has absorbed the information. And I didn't have to sweat it when she was younger the way I did. <laughs> <laughs> so, JL, the book came out in 2016, and you you just said 2020 was actually the highest selling year? What do you attribute that to? Well, I think Jonathan put his finger on it uh, in his very kind introduction. It, it has been entirely word of mouth. When I launched the book, I put a fair amount of effort into the launch. I, I sent copies out to other bloggers who are my friends. I offered for the first hundred of my readers who asked for it, a free copy, a free online copy with the caveat, they would put a review of it. And I said, hey, you know, good, bad, or indifferent, just put the review up. Obviously, I was hoping it'd be good. And they were. But that's all I ever did. I mean, it was in that first month. <clears throat> and then the book did pretty much what I expected it to do. It spiked kind of nicely uh, into the summer. It came out in June as a May or June. I'm forgetting now. It spiked kind of nicely. And then it began to drift down. And then it spiked again for Christmas a little bit. And I figured that was, and then it would just sort of drift away. But uh, in 2017, it started to ramp back up. And 2017 was much stronger than 2016 on a per month basis. 2018 was stronger than that. 2019 blew away 2018. And 2020 is blowing away 2019. And I, I think it's just word of mouth, as Jonathan pointed out. All right. So that is the, that's the arc of the book. And I'm sure people going into this new year are, are, are going to be very interested and they'll definitely check it out. But now let's talk about what is the message that this book contained that really captured the imagination? Because I think it crystallized. Well, I guess, Brad, why, why don't I just give it to you real quick, Brad? What did this book and this blog series mean to you? And then maybe we can have JL kind of engineer a little bit more about what his own experience, what experience that he had led to this book. Yeah, I think for me, investing always seemed like a black box. Like it always seemed like something that you needed to spend thousands of hours understanding. You needed some inside information. You needed some, I don't know, CFA or some CFP license or some such. And, and this is coming from me, who was a CPA and theoretically understood some stuff about finance, right? But it still seemed impenetrable to me. And when that happens, usually, your brain often just shuts down. It says, oh, that's impossible. That's for somebody else. I could never learn that. And I think that to a large degree is, is where I was until I started reading the stock series on Jim's website, JL Collins and H. And, and it just gave me, it gave me hope. It gave me a sense that, all right, if I can control what I can control, which are the expense ratios, if I can buy a little portion of every company in America, I can benefit from the ingenuity and the hard work of 150 million Americans. And I mean, these were the kind of the ideas that I got. And okay, 
this is going to give me the best chance of long-term success of a 40, 50, 60 year wealth. Right. And I think that for the first time took it from, wow, I need a stock tip. I need to get lucky. I need to play this game or this uh, casino type thing of Wall Street into, oh, wow, I'm purchasing real companies. I'm purchasing tiny little bits month after month, year after year for decades. And that's going to lead me somewhere that I'm going to be really, really happy with. And Brad, in what you just said there, I think it's important to point out, uh, JL, your experience kind of mirrors this. It's not that this is the only way that you have invested. Like the simple path of wealth is not the, is not the investing advice that you followed for the entire duration of your investing career. Rather, it's what came out of that lessons learned. I'd love for you to unpack that for the audience. So you're, you're exactly right about that. In fact, the method of investing I describe on the blog and in the book is the last method I came to and, and the best. And unlike Brad, I loved delving into this stuff, but the book is written exactly for people like Brad. And I'll explain, I'll come back and explain that in a second. But I, I enjoyed investing. It was a, a passion of mine. And I went through all the iterations. In fact, one of the dirty little secrets, if you will, is that I achieved financial independence, not with index investing, which is what I recommend now, but by picking stocks and, and picking mutual funds that were run by active managers that were picking stocks. So the point is, it's not that those things don't work. They do work. The point is that it's a lot harder and they're less powerful than investing in a low cost index fund. I've said frequently, in fact, one of sort of the backhanded compliments that sometimes my my thoughts on investing get is, oh, this is great for beginners and people who really don't want to learn about investing. Mm-hmm. Well, and I appreciate the comment that it's great, but I would say it's the best way to invest for everybody. And I said, if I thought there was a better way a more powerful way to invest that required a little more work, that's what I would have written about. But the conclusion I came to is, yeah, ironically, counterintuitively, the most powerful way to invest is also the simplest and the easiest. And I had an epiphany. Uh, my daughter came home from college one Christmas, probably. And and of course, I immediately started in on, on telling her about investing. And and she uh, she put up her hand and she said, Dad, Dad, I get it. I know it's important. I just don't want to have to think about it all the time. Kind of like what uh, Brad just said. And that was the epiphany. A light bulb went off. And I thought, you know, I'm the odd one out here. Most people don't want to think about this stuff the way I like thinking about it. Most people, like my daughter, like Brad, like you, have more important, like many of the people listening, have more important things to do with their lives. You know, they're out building businesses and bridges and curing diseases. And they know, like my daughter, like you guys, they know that investing is important, but they don't want to occupy a huge part of their life. And again, the beauty is that if you follow the approach I described, it will occupy a very small part of your life. You can set it, forget it, and get on with the more important things you're doing. And over time, you'll get the most powerful result that you can reasonably expect to get. So I think we've done a great setup here for why this is important and maybe even a little hint about the what this is. But let's just go ahead and go right to the core of it. When we say index fund investing or the simple path to wealth, what really are we talking about? And how is it possible that something that's simpler and less expensive and doesn't require that you have a person, a really smart person handling it all for How could it possibly do better? You just said, if there was a better route that could get me there more consistently, I would be doing that and writing a book on that. How is it possible that simpler is the better choice? Why don't we just go ahead and share that with the audience? Well, let me, let me start with an illustration. And the, again, I, I think of this because of a comment Brad made a moment ago about how Initially, before he he read my book, he was looking at this investment world, and it just seemed so incredibly difficult and complex and involved. And that's not his imagination. It is difficult, complex, and involved. And it's that way by design, because the more complex it's made, the more Wall Street can charge in terms of fees, the more they can encourage people to come into their arms and and the more they can say, don't worry your pretty little head about this. 
bring us your money and we will take care of it for you. And of course, they'll charge a large fee for that. So imagine that you're sitting at a huge banquet table and this banquet table is groaning under every kind of exotic dish food you could possibly imagine. And you were tasked with not only picking the ones that you wanted to eat, but trying to understand how these things were made. And what my book does is come along and say, you know what? In this tiny corner of that banquet table are the simple foods that your body really needs to thrive best. And you can put your arm in front of those foods on that table and sweep everything else onto the floor, all that complicated stuff that's out there because you don't need it and you'll get better results without it. And those simple little foods in the investment worlds are low cost index funds. Why do they work better? Well, there's a couple of reasons. One is that they're low cost. Now, Jack Bogle, who first invented the first index fund, uh, is the founder of Vanguard. He was the first one who really talked about the concept of indexing. One said, performance comes and goes, costs are forever. And so actively managed fund, active managers or stock pickers are always trying to outperform. And sometimes they do, and sometimes they don't. And on average, outperforming, as counterintuitive as this is, outperforming the market as a whole is extraordinarily difficult. Something on the order of about 20% of active managers in any one year can do it. So you have an 80% chance of, of you're going to be 80% of active managers in one year. When you go out five years, 10 years, that percentage that outperform gets smaller and smaller. By the time you're out 30 years, and by the way, investing is a long-term gain, the number of active managers who outperform the market is less than 1%. That's statistically zero. But of course, marketing people who are selling these funds point to the, the people who've done it. Think Warren Buffett. And I always cringe when, when I hear people say, well, I'll just do what Warren Buffett does. As if. I mean, that's kind of like saying, you know, I'm just going to do what Mike Tyson does and climb in the ring with him. Well, good luck. You know, you're not Mike Tyson, unless, Mike, you're listening. And if you are, <laughs> good on you. Hi, Mike. And you're, prob <laughs> and you're probably not Warren Buffett either, unless you're listening, Warren. And good to talk to you again. <laughs> And JL, the interesting thing, if I could just kind of uh, jump in here real quick, is in Warren Buffett's 2013 annual shareholder letter to his Berkshire Hathaway company, he wrote about basically how he would advise the trustee of his estate to invest the money. And he said, my advice to the trustee could not be more simple. Put 10% of the cash in short-term government bonds and 90% in a very low cost S&P 500 index fund. I suggest Vanguard's. I believe that trust long-term results from this policy will be superior to those attained by most investors, whether pension funds, institutions, or individuals who employ high fee managers. So it's fascinating that you're talking about Buffett as one of the few, few, few examples of maybe somebody who could outperform over 30 years, but yet his advice is exactly yours. Low cost well, index. Fund. It's not really surprising when you think about it because Warren Buffett is not trying to sell you his services. Right. And he knows what what it takes to make this happen. And he has watched, I'm sure, countless people try to do it and and failed. So he realizes that he's an outlier. Um, I suspect that Mike Tyson would say the same thing to the average person about boxing. You know, I, I mean, he'd say, look, you know, it takes an enormous amount of effort, enormous amount of training. And frankly, it takes some physical gifts. It's the same thing with investing, and Mike Tyson is blessed in boxing, and and Warren Buffett is blessed in uh, in investing. And I'm not Mike Tyson, and I'm not Warren Buffett, and I'm humble enough to know it. I would like to make sure that we recognize there's gonna, people listening to this that don't know what any of these terms mean. They're hearing them for the very first time. And so we just mentioned something out there. We talked about the cost. We talked about actively managed funds. We talked about index funds. Maybe people right now are thinking about individual companies that you are buying. So individual stocks that you might buy. I think there's probably, it's important for people to really get a sense for what, what is an index fund? What, what does that mean? Um, and specifically, you, now we've mentioned this Warren Buffett S&P 500. Is that the one that you talk about in your book? Kind of give us a little sense for definitions of terms and why we're putting such an emphasis on index funds. 
Sure. So let's start with what's a mutual fund and or an ETF, which stands for exchange traded fund. There are slight differences between those, but for the purpose of our conversation, we'll lump them together. A fund or an ETF takes a bunch of money from a lot of different investors, lumps it together, and then invests in something. And the funds tell you what they're going to invest in. So the S&P 500 index fund invests in the 500 largest U.S. companies that make up the S&P 500 index, which tracks those companies. An actively managed mutual fund might focus on a different kind of parameter. They could be a sector fund. They might focus on energy or technology. But it's a pool of money that comes in and that's invested according to to the guidelines that the, the fund sets up. So what's the difference then between active managed and indexing? Well, an active management fund is one that attempts to pick stocks that will outperform over time the index. And that's an expensive thing to do among other reasons. I mean, you those guys are highly paid. They typically have analysts working for them or that they're paying on the side. So that's an expensive route, and it's reflected in what you, the investor, pay for the fund. That's called an expense ratio. Now, there are lots of other ways that funds can dip into your pocket, but just to keep it simple for now, the expense ratio is the main one. Every fund, index or otherwise, has an expense ratio, and it matters a lot as to how high that expense ratio is. Interestingly, with the advent of index funds and as their growing popularity, that has had the benefit of forcing down the fees that actively managed funds charge. So even people who still want to invest actively have been blessed, if you will, by the advent of index funds because it's lowered their costs. But an index fund, because it doesn't have those expensive managers, has rock bottom fees. To put that in perspective, VTSAX, which is the fund that I recommend most, has a fee of 0.04%. That's about as close to zero as you can get and not be there. An actively managed fund, I think, averages something like 1%. I think it's really important for people to like translate that into like something that's meaningful to them. Because I can imagine someone saying to themselves, well, one percent is not that bad. That means I keep ninety nine percent. You know, I'm great. Point zero four percent is less, but one percent is still. They're letting me hold on to ninety nine percent. What's the problem? Yeah, and, and you know, the other thing is not only are are they presenting it in that fashion, but they're also saying, you know, if we can return eighteen twenty percent, what's one percent coming to us? Well, that's a big if returning that kind of percentage over time. But one percent compounded. It gives extraordinary results. I mean, it's just amazing how much money, and that's your money, goes into their pocket as opposed to yours. Better way to look at it is, let's suppose that you had a million dollar portfolio and you were gonna withdraw 4% of that, which is commonly viewed as a reasonably safe thing to do over time, right? And you're in actively managed funds that are charging 1%. Well, you're withdrawing 4%, that's $40,000, 1% of your annual income, $10,000, is going to the people running those funds. So that's the better way to look at the 1%, not as, well, it's only 1% against 99, but how much of your income, and even if you're not drawing on your portfolio, that 1% is still being drawn from it, which reduces the amount of money that can grow for you, that can compound for you over time. So we can we can get lost in the weeds on the math of this, but maybe suffice to say, 1% is a big deal over time. I'm going to give this back to Brad because I know, Brad, you've been able to run these and tell stories with it. But ju just if you could quickly recall, we ran this one example where someone is paying, you know, 1% to expense ratios and then 1% assets under management. If you could just draw up a version of that, you know, real quick back of the envelope for the audience. For an individual over an investing lifetime, what did that 2% difference make over their investing lifetime? Uh, it's good to have an accountant in the group. <laughs> <laughs> and Jonathan, you know me so well. I, I literally was furiously calling yes. up this article while, while JL was talking about it. So 
admittedly, this is an article I wrote years ago. So the actual return, the gross return that I anticipated is a little higher than is probably reasonable, but the math works. So that's the key part here. So I talked about $100,000 invested, and this is over a 40 year period. You're putting a thousand dollars in monthly. Okay. So this is a 40 year investing lifetime. You're starting with a hundred grand. Let's say you get a 9% gross return. So that's just 9% year over year return. And that again, that's higher than we anticipate now, but, but let's put that aside. Your balance at year 40 would be 7.2 million. Okay. If you invested that money in Vanguard's VTSAX, which at that time had a 0.05 expense ratio, it's actually lowered as JL just told us you would have lost about a little more than a hundred thousand dollars to fees. Okay. So you'd, instead of having 7.2 million, you'd have 7.1 million. All right. If you instead put it in a typical 1% expense ratio fund and got then an 8% net return, you would have lost $1.9 million to fees. You would only have about 5.3 million. And if you doubled down on this and had that expensive fund plus an investment advisor who charged you 1% assets under management. So you only had a 7% net return. You would have lost $3.3 million to fees. So you would have a little more than half of what you would have had if you invested this in VTSAX. So that is as stark of an example of fees matter and they compound over these decades over an investing lifetime. So Brad, you mentioned VTSAX. Again, going back to definition of terms here, because we talked about this S&P 500 fund by Warren Buffett, but uh, JL Collins, you're talking a little bit more about this VTSAX. I'd love for our audience to understand what that represents. And the one thing I'd like to add on to that is that when we own an index fund in a particular sector, that means we own all the companies, which means that potentially we're owning winners and losers. And how is it possible that if we're owning winners and losers, we're going to do better than someone that's only picking the winners. <laughs> well, let me start with that last one. If, if you could find someone who only picked winners, that person would do better. <clears throat> but that person isn't even Warren Buffett. Not even Warren Buffett only picks winners. So that's really not a very apt comparison. VTSAX is Vanguard's total stock market index fund. And that means that it invests in virtually every publicly traded company in the United States, and that's around 3,600 companies. The fund that uh, Warren Buffett has recommended is, I forget what the call letters are on it, but it's Vanguard's Index 500 fund, and it invests only in the, the 500 largest U.S. companies. That, by the way, is the same fund that Jack Bogle the founder of Vanguard and the creator of index funds, that is the fund that he was invested in for all of his life. He now, he passed away a couple of years ago and it was the first fund that, that Mr. Bogle started. So are these guys wrong? Should they be in VTSAX? No. I mean, that's an awesome fund and anybody who's holding it can comfortably hold it forever. In fact, there's very little difference between VTSAX and the S&P 500 fund because these index funds are cap weighted. That simply means that they own more of the largest companies. So about 80% of VTSAX is in the S&P 500. And then the other 15, 20% is in smaller mid cap and small cap companies. I like having a little bit of the small and mid cap companies, which is why I prefer it. But it's kind of like, do you like a little hot sauce on your eggs or not? It's not going to make a whole lot of difference long term. I say to people, you know, if if you buy the index, uh, the S&P 500 fund and I buy the total stock market fund 10 years from now, one of us will have done slightly better than the other but it'll be very, very close. And there's no predicting who will have done slightly better. So don't worry about it. You know, it's very interesting, uh, actually timely right now as we're going into 2021 is that we actually do have this interesting use case, which actually points a little bit towards the advantages of one versus the other. And that is specifically with Tesla, a real market mover here. And I just, I would love to get your perspective on this, but let's just highlight the way these two would work. So with Tesla, you have a relatively small market cap company that just exploded 
and has become massive, massive, massive. And now because of its sign meets its qualifications and is now is getting added uh, almost retroactively to the S and P 500, but it has massive market cap and it's only now being added to the S and P 500. Whereas with VTSAX, it's a publicly traded company and you owned it the entire time that it was publicly traded inside the United States. So you actually saw some of that gain was included in your own personal return. This is a very weird example, maybe a once in a lifetime example in that Tesla is such an, a ridiculous outlier that the S and P 500 would not have captured the rise the same way that like a VTSAX would. It's one of those things that I'd love just your comment on. If you've thought about that, or if that in any way, um, adds anything to your opinion, uh, just because they're talking about when they're adding Tesla to the S and P 500, they really were concerned that it would shake things around a little bit while they were figuring it out. What are your thoughts on that? That's a, that's a great, great question and, and a great example. So let me start by saying one of the things I love about index funds, uh, whether it's the index 500 or, or the total stock market, is they are what I call self-cleansing. It's a term I'm proud of because I created it. And what that means is that you're not trying to pick the winners and losers because you realize you can't do that, but you benefit from the winners. And if some company uh, hits the rocks, it will drift away from your portfolio, right? So what's the worst that can happen to a company? Well, you can lose 100%. And by the way, it'll fall off the index long before it actually loses 100% unless something very quick and catastrophic happens. Think Enron. Anyway, what's the upside? Well, the upside is 100% or 200, or 10,000, or 100,000 percent, something like Tesla. So the the index is always self-cleansing. You're always picking up the winners, and you're always shedding the losers. And Tesla's a great example of where owning the total stock market plays to your advantage, a very dramatic example of it. There are much less dramatic examples of that, and this is one of the reasons I like the total stock market, is you will pick them up uh, Every company that ultimately makes its way to the uh, 500 index, you will pick up earlier. By the same token, though, in all fairness, if a company on the index begins to lose its touch and drift down, if you own the index 500, once it falls off that index, it's out of your portfolio. If you own the total stock market, it will drift down further before it falls off. So I'm sure there's an example. I can't think of one. As you pointed out, Tesla is a great example of the upside. I'm sure there's an example of of one drifting down on the downside that you would have been better off being rid of sooner with the S&P 500 than with the total stock market. And that's probably one of the reasons those two track as closely as they actually do. Does that make sense? Yeah, that was great. I just thought it was such a timely analogy, really highlighting the difference between an S&P 500 versus a total stock market fund. Right. And the other thing, I don't know if you want to record this or not, with Tesla, now I own Tesla. Well, actually, I've owned it for a while, but I don't have to worry about Tesla's future. If Tesla continues to blow the doors off as it has, I'll continue to benefit. If Tesla starts to slow down for whatever reason, well, it's one of 3,600 companies I own. It'll slowly drift down and it'll be replaced by, by something else. Uh, and that's the difference between owning it in the index and owning it as a stock. Yeah, Jim, I, I love that analysis that, right, when you said, I, I now own a little bit of Tesla, like my <laughs> my eyebrows went up, but I thought you actually bought individual shares. I'm like, no, let it, <laughs> it can't be. But But yeah, you're right. As part of having a total stock market index fund and now an S&P 500 fund, we all do own a little bit of all of these companies, but like you said, it is self-cleansing. And that's, that is again, something that's very reassuring to me. And, and I wanted to kind of go back to the, the fees because we actually get this question a lot. And I just want to make it clear when you're talking about VTSAX here, like we're not giving very specific advice to go out and buy this exact thing. Obviously like this is informational use only, but we, you and I, and Jonathan, uh, we, believe in this for our own selves. And I think that's what's important is we're talking about our own experiences, right? And you've for years talked about Vanguard and VTSAX. But what a lot of people have asked is what about Fidelity and their 0% fees, right? They have these these new funds. I think it's, what is it? FZROX is their total stock market 
Yeah, so FZROX, and that has 0% expense ratio. Like, we've actually had emails come in, like, should I sell VTSAX and buy this FZROX? Like, and I say, there are lots of good funds, you know, Fidelity, Schwab, Vanguard, other companies. There are lots of funds that are substantially similar. But I guess my question to you is, why do you like Vanguard? And what's your response to that question about Fidelity or just, hey, it's not 0.04, it's 0.02. What do I do then? So that, that's a that's a broad question. Uh, there actually there are a couple of questions woven in there. So you might have have to help me remember them <laughs> as, as I answer the ones that I, that I start with. Uh, so first of all, <clears throat> let me say that an S and P five hundred index fund is essentially the same whether it's in Vanguard or Fidelity or T Rowe Price or any other because it's tracking an index. Right. Same thing with the total stock market index fund. VTSAX is Vanguard's, and I don't know off the top of my head what Fidelity's are, but it will be essentially the same portfolio, right? So it will it should get identical performance. The reason I prefer Vanguard is Vanguard is the only investment company out there that is structured in a fashion that their interests and the investors' interests are identical. And that's because the investors actually own the Vanguard funds. That's a profound difference because it motivates Vanguard to continually drive down costs. So you mentioned correctly that VTSAX used to have an expense ratio of 0.05. It actually used to be higher than that. And Vanguard has steadily brought it down because that's the culture at Vanguard is to lower costs. There's no point in having higher costs at Vanguard because those would just create a taxable event that would go into the pockets, into our pockets as the investors. Fidelity and every other, this is not unique to Fidelity, but every other investment company serves two masters. They certainly serve the, their investors who invest in their fund. That's how they keep people coming back but they also serve their owners. Now, Fidelity happens to be a privately held company. T. Rowe Price is an example of publicly traded companies, so its shareholders are its owners. But of those two masters, the owners are always gonna be number one. And so Fidelity and T. Rowe Price and every other company has as their primary motivation to make as much money in fees from their investors as they can. Now, if that's the case, why do they have zero fees. Well, it's a it's a loss leader competitive move. They're obviously trying to, to steal people away from Vanguard, and they've done it on a pricing basis. I'm not going to switch because, A, I know their heart's not in lower costs. Their heart's just in a, a promotional thing. I don't trust how long it's going to continue. Somebody has to pick up the cost of running that fund. So basically what they're doing is shifting the burden to people who own other funds that have fees, I have an ethical issue with that. So I would not go to Fidelity for that. And the other thing is to, when you get fees are important, but at a certain level, they become academic. When you're down to 0.04%, you're not really, to, you're not gonna have the kind of result that you so eloquently described with one or 2%. So, you know, there, there's a point where you, you can stop chasing it. There is a reason that when Jack Bogle died, he was worth, I think, $300 million, which is a lot of money. But if he had structured Vanguard the way other companies are structured, he would have had multiple billions of dollars. But that's because he chose to create a company that favored the investor as opposed to the owner. Let me add a comment on that as well. I actually have uh, total stock market funds with Fidelity with Schwab and with Vanguard. I agree with most of what JL Collins just said. I would never move to go from 0.04% to 0 0.01 or 0 0.02 or 0 0.03 or zero. Like I just don't make moves based on that, but I wouldn't, you know, I don't have any, there's no problem there. Go with whichever one your 401k offers and be happy about how low the fees are. And then, you know, if you're picking in a vacuum, you can certainly appreciate JL Collins perspective on how Vanguard is about us. Their heart is 100% in the right place. So I'll just double down on what you just said. Yeah. And it's, it's much more important to invest in low cost index funds than it is to worry about 
who's providing them. You know, when you're talking about these different types of funds, I think one thing, because people often have been on the sidelines because suddenly it's simple and it makes sense. They're like, I'm ready to get started. And then one thing that maybe one of the things they bump up against is a cost to get started. And it used to be that with VTSAX, it used to be that I think you needed as much as like $10,000 to get started with the fund. And I believe that's come down. I'd love for you to talk about what it looks like generally to get started with this type of approach. And then maybe as that also relays to like, you know, ETFs versus mutual funds, just kind of in your mind with your community and your audience, how do people best get started now? And, you know, if they don't have $10,000. Hey everyone, we're going to be right back to your jail's response to that. And you're not going to want to miss it. But first a quick word from some of our sponsors. Yeah, so Vanguard is not only continually driving down costs as part of their corporate culture, but they also are continually trying to make things more accessible at the same time as maintaining value for their existing shareholders. So it used to be VTSAX had an investor shares version. I forget what those what what the ticker uh, letters were for that, but there was a three thousand dollar entry minimum to get into that and VTSAX was 10,000 and it had a slightly higher expense ratio. So the moment you got to 10,000, you should have switched it to VTSAX for the lower ratio. Now they've done away with that investor shares and they've just made the entry as last time I looked at least $3,000 for VTSAX, which is their admiral share version as they call it. So they've lowered the cost of entry at same way they're lowering expenses. Now, what if you don't have $3,000? Well, you mentioned ETFs and there is an ETF version. I think it's VTI or the call letters for that. And one of the nice things about a, an ETF is, is you can buy with any amount of money. So you can start with as little money as you have and then just keep adding it if you want to if you want to do that. And there's nothing wrong with holding an ETF for the long term. It doesn't have to be a mutual fund. Let's uh, differentiate that if you don't mind, because I mean, we're talking now about an ETF versus a mutual fund. Can you maybe distinguish some of the pros and the cons of each, or even if it's not a pro or a con, what some of the differences are for someone that's trying to pick between the two? Well, let's start out with with the similarities, right? So as I said, I think VTI is the ETF exchange traded fund version of VTSAX. They hold exactly the same portfolio. They have, I think, the same uh, expense ratio or it's very, very close. The ETF might be slightly lower. ETFs were created primarily as trading vehicles, right? So you could take in a mutual fund and trade it during the day. Traditionally, and to this day for that matter, if you buy or sell a mutual fund, you put in the order sometime during during the uh, business hours, and you will get the price at the close of the market that day. So you might put in an order at 10 o'clock in the morning and, and see the price go up or down before your order is executed. If you bought an individual stock, your order gets executed almost immediately at whatever that price is. And an ETF just takes a mutual fund portfolio and allows it to trade just like a single stock. So when you buy an ETF, you get whatever that price is immediately. If you're buying and holding for decades, which I recommend, you don't have any need for that. If you are trading in and out of your fund, then you're going to want an ETF, but you're also making a terrible mistake. Uh, Warren Buffett once said that, you know, in the last century, the market started at something like 600 and ended at 12,000. How does somebody lose money in a market in a century like that? And he said, it's easy. They dance, try to dance in and out of the market. They try to market time. So I'm not at least bit interested in trading. I don't care about that, but that's one of the key advantages or distinctions, maybe is a better word than advantages that ETFs have. But the key thing is that they are very, very similar, that the differences are much less important than the similarities for our kind of investing. Right. So for someone who is maybe sticking around and trying to wait until they get that $3,000 to invest in VTSAX, in your mind, there's no reason not to just start buying shares of VTI in that case, right? The 
the ETF that's at least at the time of recording, it's under $200 per share. Like if that was a point of differentiation and someone came to you and said, JL, it's going to take me a year to save $3,000. Should I just start buying individual shares of this ETF? What, what would your response be to that? Well, so it's two things. One, there, there's no reason in the world not to start with the ETF version. On the other hand, a year is no time at all. I mean, if you're talking about investing for decades, so if it were me, I'd probably just save up the money over the course of the year. But if somebody wants to get going right away, and I appreciate you know, that maybe they read my book or blog or something else and they get excited about it, then there's no reason at all not to buy the ETF. Again, my only concern, and there are other differences of ETFs, but they're so small in my mind, I can't even bring them to mind at the moment, even though I've, I've written a post about it. So listeners can go and find find that post. The only concern I have about ETFs is, again, it makes it so easy to trade in and out of it. And trying to time the market and trading in and out is so tempting and so destructive to your wealth. That would be my only concern. You know, I, it's one less temptation. But in terms of the portfolio and the performance over long term, it's going to be the same. I think I wanted to add a little bit extra flavor here and hopefully it'll add value to our audience that maybe is at this particular point in the journey. Um, two things. One, with ETFs, you traditionally did have to purchase a whole share amount. So with like VTSAX, if you had $35, you want to contribute this, you could just contribute the $35 and buy whatever fractional share of that mutual fund that you wanted. No big deal. With an ETF historically, and again, I, you can hear there's a caveat there, historically, you needed to buy a whole share. So like if the ETF is selling for $170, you have 180, then you could buy one share at 170 and then you have $10 sitting on the sideline. Conversely, if you're buying the mutual fund, you could just buy $180 worth of that mutual fund and all of your money is at the work. It's not sitting on the sidelines. The caveat being now with tools like M1, M1 Finance is the one that you guys have heard me mention repeatedly it will now allow you to buy fractional shares of ETF. So you could find something like VTI on the M1 finance platform, and you could buy a fractional share of this amount. The other thing that came to mind, I don't know if you have an answer on this, but I feel like I'd heard this before. If you were to purchase this ETF called VTI on the Vanguard platform, and you were to have something like, you know, 30, 40, 50, 100 shares, you were to easily blow by the $3,000, you know, limit, do they have some sort of in-kind transition on the Vanguard platform where you can go from VTI to, you know, the mutual fund alternative if you wanted to do that? I'm just wondering if I'm making that up or if you had ha heard something similar about that. I don't know the answer to that. And it's an important question because if you hold these things in a tax advantage account like an IRA, you can just go from VTI to VTSAX or the other way. And because it's in a tax sheltered account, there's no tax consequence. But if you hold it outside of, of a tax favored account, it's possible that in selling your VTI to buy VTSAX, you might trigger a capital gain if you have a gain or, or a capital loss. And that's something to consider. I know that in the old days, when they had investor shares and admiral shares, you could go from one, you could go from investor shares to admiral, and it was not a taxable event. Uh, whether that's true of going to the ETF to the mutual fund candidly, I, I don't know. I've never looked at it. But I'm sure that if anybody's curious, the Vanguard website will tell you, or you can call them and they can answer that for you. I wanted to switch gears and talk about uh, time in the market versus timing. We just came through actually a very interesting, um, uh, well, we all lived it, 2020, very interesting year. And uh, there were some individuals that even in January or February said, I got to get my money out of the market. And, and then those people in March felt really good about it. But then other individuals that said, I need to keep my money out of the market. And then the market went right back up and they they missed the ride. And And then, but even now, some people, some people would say, you know, if you know it's going to go down, why wouldn't you just get all your money out? You know, what if we could just skip when the market goes down and only buy it, you know, when it's going up, wouldn't we make more? You can see what I'm setting up for you here, JL. But I'm just curious, people that are like, why not time the market? We could just skip all the bumps. Well, wouldn't that be wonderful? Uh, <laughs> you know, and it would be just as wonderful if, if, if I could magically turn, uh, 
random items into gold. The problem is I can't do that. And nobody can time the market. Now, how do I know that nobody can time the market? How can I make such a sweeping statement? Well, this is how. Anybody who could successfully do what you just said, step out when the market was about to go down, wait till it got to its bottom, step back in, and repeat that reliably over time, would be far, far richer than Warren Buffett, far, far more lionized. There is no superpower more powerful in the financial world than the ability to do that. And that's one of the reasons a lot of people try to do it. That's what we were referring to when I said Warren Buffett said, how do you lose money in a century where the market goes up so extraordinarily? You try to dance in and out of it. Dancing in and out of it is, is, is trying to time the market. It just doesn't work. Now, sometimes some people get it right. In 1987, just before Black Monday, which was, I think, in October, uh, like with weeks before, there was, a, there was a woman on Wall Street by the name of Elaine Garzarelli who predicted it almost precisely, almost precisely the day, almost precisely the level of that drop, which was the single biggest percentage drop in history. I think it was about 25% in one day. And, and of course, she was immediately, and it was documented that she'd made this prediction, she was immediately lionized and, and on all the talk shows and, and what have you. And everybody figured they, this was a woman who knew how to do this. She got lucky. She was never able to consistently repeat that. That's not a slam on Elaine. Nobody's able to do it. The analogy I use is if you knew somebody who won the Powerball lottery, you wouldn't look at that person and say, Brad, you have figured out how to pick winning lottery numbers. No, you would look at it and say, Brad, you got stunningly lucky because so many people were buying lottery numbers that somebody had to come up with the winning combination. And Brad happened to be the one. That doesn't mean Brad has any predictive powers. He happened to get lucky. It's the same thing with Wall Street. In any given moment in time, there are so many people making predictions that virtually anything that the market can do at any given period of time has almost, by definition, been predicted. And some person is going to be right. doesn't mean they have predictive abilities. It just means they happen to get the lottery numbers. So you cannot time the market. And if you try to time the market, it will bring tears. You mentioned the spring, and it is a great example. I have, for years now, been preaching the fact you can't time the market. I have no idea what the market's doing right now. I don't know what's going to do tomorrow. I don't know what's going to do between now and the end of the year or what's going to do next year. With pretty significant confidence, 20 years out, I could say it's going to be substantially up, even 10 years, because I have history to support that. But in the short term, the market is very volatile, very unpredictable. So last spring, COVID comes along. It comes out of nowhere, and the market takes an immediate dive. And I'm on Twitter, I'm on Facebook, I'm on my blog saying the same thing. I don't know what's going to happen next. You know, And the market, I think, got down as far as loss of about 32 33%. I had lots of people commenting on my social media and on my blog saying, Jim, this time it's different. This time it's a pandemic. This time it's, it's you know, all the reasons that it's different. And I said, well, you have knowledge that I don't have. I even posted on Twitter at one point that I've, I've discovered a new symptom of COVID, clairvoyance, <laughs> because it just seemed that everybody around me knew exactly what the market was going to do. Well, I've often said Mr. Market will do exactly what it takes to embarrass the most people. So, of course, the market immediately turned around sharply and has never looked back. Did I know that was going to happen? No. I mean, when the market was down to 32%, I was saying it could go down another 32%. It could turn around and go back up. It could bounce along. Nobody knows. And the most important thing when you start investing to understand is you have to stay the course. And if you get chased out every time you get scared because you think the market's going to go down, you're going to lose. Markets are volatile. And the market will go down by the term you own it. It's, it's like living in New England and being surprised when it snows. And by the way, 
the blizzard doesn't last forever. It might be miserable. It might be difficult to live with. But just like a market drop, it doesn't last forever. Sunny days come again. It's like living in Florida and being surprised if there's a hurricane. Well, that's part of living in Florida. Does that mean hurricanes aren't scary? No. Does it mean they don't do damage? No. Does it mean you be, shouldn't be surprised? Yes, you should not be surprised. And the hurricane will pass. It's the same thing with the market. You don't know when the storms are coming. You know ultimately they'll pass. The thing to do is stay the course. And a lot of what we talk about with investing, it, it is this psychological aspect, right? Of you try to time the market, you try to, and I'm not saying this as a good thing, clearly, but people, Sorry. people try to time the market. They try to say, oh, I think it's going to do this. And, oh, I should put more money in, or I should just wait until it gets to this point. And, and your point is nobody can time the market. You, you can't, you're lucky enough to get it right once, but you have to get it right on both sides, the buying and the selling, which is virtually impossible. So it's just really a fool's errand, but, but we shouldn't discount the psychological aspect of when you see a 32, 33% drop, right? And like you said, you have to expect it occasionally, certainly over an investing lifetime, but that doesn't mean that it's not painful. It doesn't mean that it, you don't have to steal yourself for this inevitability, right? And, and I guess my question to you is you've been through a bunch of these experiences over your investing lifetime. How did you react personally, if at all? And, and that might be the answer also, like just internally, not that I expect that you sold things clearly, that, that's not what I'm talking about. The, the psychological aspect, when, when March came and it did drop 30 some odd percent, what was going through your mind at that point? So I think this is not going, what was going through my mind at that point, but this general question, Brad, is might be the single most important thing we talk about today. I've written, and I, I think it's in my book, it's certainly on my blog, I have written that nobody should follow my advice until they are absolutely clear that they will not sell when the market drops. They will not sell in panic. Because if you do, if you're not absolutely sure about that, and you do sell when the market drops and in a panic, which as you just pointed out is a very natural reaction, market drops are very scary. My advice will leave you bleeding by the side of the road. Any investing advice will leave you bleeding by the side of the road. So job one, before you go down the simple path to wealth, as I outlined it, is to make sure you've got your mind right. that. You just know that selling is not an option when the time comes because you know that these drops, while they're scary and terrifying, and it's it's horrifying to look at your portfolio and see it's down 30 or 40 percent, it is also temporary, just like the hurricanes. When it's sitting on top of you and the winds are blowing and the windows are rattling, it's it's terrifying, but it'll pass. And until you know that. You should not follow my advice or any investing advice. Now, I frequently thought to myself, is that something people can learn just by my saying it, by reading what I've written about it? Or do you have to live through one of these things and make the mistake of selling at the bottom? I had to live through it. So in 1987, I mentioned Black Monday came along. This is in the days before computers and online trading where you actually had stockbrokers. And that was a Monday, Black Monday. I was working. I had no idea what was going on in the market. It's not like you could call it up on your computer like we do today. And at the end of the day, just on a whim, I called Wayne, who was my stockbroker, and he was kind of a friend, right? And I just hadn't talked to Wayne in a while. And then I just randomly called him that day. And I, he picks up the phone. And I say, hey, man, how you doing? And there's this long pause. And he says, you're joking, right? And I said, no. He said, you don't know what happened today? And I said, no. And he said, man, this has been the worst day of my life. And he went on to tell me that the market had dropped 25%. Well, I was horrified. That meant you know, that I had 25% less money than I had before. Now, I knew what the right thing to do was. I knew the right thing to do was to stay the course. And in fact, I did that for a month and then two months and then three months. And after that initial drop, the market just kept grinding down lower and lower and lower and lower. And finally, I didn't have the fortitude. I didn't have my mind right. 
And I sold, I want to say three, maybe four months into it. And if that wasn't the exact day the market decided to turn around, it was it was close enough not to matter. And then I sat on the sidelines for a year and watched the market march right on back up and past where it had been on Black Monday before I finally got in. That lesson is burned into my mind. So how did I feel in 2008? I was scared. I mean, man, in, in 2008, 2009, you know, March 2009, the market hit. And this is something that people ought to think about before they, if they've never been through a major collapse, this is what it looks like. March of 2009, the market hit its bottom. I want to say that it was 666, the biblical market, the devil. What you have to understand is nobody knew that was the bottom at that time. That was about a 50% drop. Nobody knew that was the bottom. All the smart people I was talking to at that point were saying, it's going to drop another two-thirds. So let's do that mentally. Let's suppose you went into that crash with a million two. And by March of 2009, your million two is now 600,000. And everybody around you is saying it's about to go to 200,000. That's what a really ugly market looks like. And do you stay the course under that circumstance? I did. But I'm not sure I could have done it if I didn't have that 1987 experience. I'm not sure I could have done it just based on knowing it intellectually without going it through my gut. So that's one of the things I worry about with my readers, because the markets other than this March has really, since I've been writing my blog, done pretty much nothing but go up. But you have to be prepared for those gut-wrenching changes. Now, the other thing you asked is, how did I feel in March? didn't even phase me a little bit. I didn't even think about it, you know? So now I look back and I say, I wish I'd moved some bonds. <laughs> <laughs> Should have rebalanced. Uh, okay. Yeah. So this is great. And I, I think the one other thing I wanted to go to is actually back to self-cleansing a little bit here. Cause I don't think, I don't think people realize how powerful that actually is. So let's play out an actual scenario here. A person is invested in just straight winners. They've picked a few companies that have been rock solid companies the last 10 years. And these companies are just absolutely crushing and they, they own the actual stocks. The other individual has invested in like a total stock market index fund the last 10 years. And they also have had a good run, you know, maybe not gone up quite as high as these others, but they own all the same companies inside of the index fund. Now, the thing about it is that the index fund is cap weighted. And, and you said that in passing, but for people that means that in your total stock market index fund, you own a disproportionate percentage of the more valuable, the higher market cap companies. And we know kind of what these are. These would be Facebook, Amazon, Apple, Microsoft, Netflix, now Tesla. You know, the, these types of tech companies are going to disproportionately take up the top. Now, now here's the hypothetical here. And I just want to compare and contrast, and I'd love for you to kind of play it out a little bit, JL, you know, what self-cleansing means in this context. We go into the new year and some sort of antitrust legislation happens or maybe something else. I don't know who knows what it is, but one of these massive companies or multiple of these massive companies or whatever, some unknown thing happens. And these companies that make up a vast percentage, a huge percentage. And like Brad, we looked it up the other day. What do like the top five or 10 companies make up in terms of holdings in a VTSAX fund? Yeah, I think it was somewhere around a quarter. I think when we looked up uh, the S&P 500, it was somewhere around a 30%, maybe a little bit less. And I think it's about a quarter, but I can, uh, I can get back to you if it's markedly different. No, no, it's fine. So like 20, do we say like 20 companies make up 30% of your holdings in an S&P 500 fund? It was something along those lines. That so, sounds about right to me. Yeah. Cool. So, all right. So in this example, um, this one individual owns this total stock market fund. So 30% of their net worth is tied up in a small group of companies disproportionately in the tech sector. Something really bad happens and some of these companies go away, get crushed in 50%, they get split up, maybe they go to zero. Obviously, some sort of black swan event like that would be pretty demoralizing for either of these investors. But I'm curious your take on the self-cleansing approach that would occur inside of a total stock market index fund versus the stock investor who just directly bought these companies and they watched it go to zero. What, you know, what would be the difference there? And just kind of play that out a little bit. That's a, that's a great, great question. So one of the criticisms of index funds is just what you were talking about. So they'll look at the VTSAX of today and of recent years, 
And they'll say, you know, essentially, because it's cap weighted, as you described, and the biggest companies are a very large percentage of the total portfolio, you're buying a technology heavy fund. You know, you're really betting on technology. And today that's true. But what's lost in looking at it just today is the fact that that wasn't always true. You know, in the past, the index has been dominated by financial companies. It's been dominated by energy companies. And that's the self-cleansing thing because any company that rises to the top rises to the top of the index and you own more of it. Any sector, whether it's technology or energy or financial or real estate or whatever the sector might be, if that is going to have its moment in the sun, it will rise to the top of your index and you will own it as it's rising just like you own technology as it's rising now. At some point, I have no idea when, at some point I would guess that technology is going to fade away and it might be replaced with something else at the top. That's an advantage. That's part of the self-cleansing process. And your hypothetical investor who owns, say, those 10 top technology stocks and is just going to hold them is going to be badly hurt in that process because he's going to get the fading effect without the new companies taking their place. Now, to be clear, anybody who bought the 10 biggest technology companies in the S&P 500 or the total stock market today has vastly outperformed, right? But they got very lucky. They picked the, the right sector, the right companies, because there are a lot of technology companies that didn't work out. And they're now vulnerable to this fading effect. Let me give you an ex two examples to illustrate this. Back when I was young and uh, we were showing dinosaurs out of the path in around 1968, 1970, somebody came up with the concept of what they called the Nifty 50. And the idea was they looked at the 50 most successful publicly traded companies in the United States at that point and said, you know what? These are blue chip companies. If you buy these 50 companies, you can just buy them and forget about them because they will give you great performance over the decades. Well, of course, there were no Teslas in that 50. There were no Amazons. There were no Microsofts. There were no Oracles. There were no Facebooks. You know, they were companies like Kodak, like General Motors. I mean, these were the stars of the day. The wheel turns. While they were the most powerful companies of their time, they're not the most powerful companies today. And the most powerful companies today will not be the most powerful companies decades from now. I used to like to say to people, you know, the Dow Index, which is the most popular one, is now 30 companies. It started in 1880, 1890, something like that, at 18 companies. And I like to say, how many of those 18 companies do you think are still in the Dow 30 today? Wow. The answer used to be one. No, it used to be one. It was General Electric. And about two years ago, General Electric faded off. Wow. So now the Dow Jones Industrial Average has no companies that were on there originally. Is that a bad thing? No, it just means that the dominant companies of the late 1800s were not the dominant companies of the late 1900s or the early 2000s. That's why this self-cleansing process, and again, very proud of that term, is such a powerful part of owning the index because you will always, you never have to worry about what's fading and what's rising because you will always be there. All right. Wow. We've gone just about an hour, almost an hour and a half here. And this every single question was really a slightly better version of a question that we asked in episode 19. I think the information that we covered is timely. I think it's necessary. I think it's vital for someone getting started on the journey to just be aware of this as a strategy for getting started. I think it removes a lot of the fear. And I think you're doing a great service to this community and to the world by sharing this approach because it just makes sense. Some things when you see them, you're just like, yep, that's it. That makes sense. That's right. It's unassailable because it's just true. It's just kind of how it has worked and how it will work going into the future. JL, I would love to just invite you to join us again at some point over the next couple of months to continue the conversation and expand this 
to other asset classes and uh, other strategies. So we would need to talk about maybe the role of bonds in a portfolio, smoothing the ride, as, as I know you've mentioned in the past. And also we've talked about accumulation, but what does decumulation, what does drawdown look like for you? Would you like to come back on the show at some point in the near future? I'd love to. I love hanging out with you guys. Uh, I, uh, by the way, kudos to you for, for the incredible platform you've built and the incredible service you provide to the community. So anytime I can add value to that, I'm, I'm happy to hang out with you. I always have a good time. So why not? Nice. All right, everyone. So let me just give you, um, Obviously, we talked about the book, The Simple Path to Wealth. You can wait for the next you know, episode, but I would encourage you, what a great time to, to read this content and realize that it, it has always worked and it will be the best chance. You know, if, if you want to give yourself the best chance of success, stop trying to beat the game, right? Stop trying to beat the game and just, just realize that it's time in the market, not timing the market. And you can win over time just by keeping it simple. Go check out this book, The Simple Path to Wealth. You can find it. At, it's very easy to find on JL's website. Just go to jlcollinsnh.com, jlcollinsnh.com. There's a banner on the right-hand side to pick up a copy of the book and let them know. Leave them a review. Let them know that you appreciate it. Let them know that it's been helpful. Give them some feedback on this episode. We are so grateful for his time. JL, thanks again for coming on the show today. My pleasure. Thanks for the invitation. I'm already looking forward to next time. All right, everyone. I am so excited about how this episode came together. It's one that it's time. And honestly, you could listen to the original episode 19 that we did, probably worth your time, and still get incredible value from this episode. It's timely, it's meaningful, and, and uh, I think it's very important information. Please listen to it, take action on it, share it with friends and family member. A lot of people have had a lot of stuff taken away from this year. And I think in a world of uncertainty, simple information like this truly can make a difference. All right, my friends, the fire is spreading. We'll see you next time as we continue to go down the road less traveled. You've been listening to Choose FI Radio Podcast, where we help middle-class America build wealth one life hack at a time.